would be like starting a diet and never stepping on the scale or getting your body fat measured. On days when you didn't feel like you were making any progress, you'd have no way to refute that feeling with data. We need data. But what kind of data? Because some data is deadly. At least it was for me. And there's a counselor named Chuck who can verify that. I might be the first person in the history of therapy to need a counselor because of blog statistics. In the first six months of working on the Stuff Christians Like blog, I got really fascinated by Google Analytics, or GA. GA is a simple piece of code that will track any activity on your website. With a click of a button, you can instantly know how many unique visitors you had to your site, where they came from, what they read, and how long they stayed. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of ways to measure everything on your blog. I believe I use them all. At first, it was okay. I would check in a few times every day to see if I was getting a lot of comments, see how the page view numbers were, and measure a few other key stats. I'd get a little hit of adrenaline every time I saw something spike on the graph, and a little hit of depression every time something I wrote bottomed out. I liked seeing the instant feedback so much that I started to check GA every few hours, then every hour, and then every few minutes. I started to see the statistics not as a measure of my blog traffic, but as a measure of my self-worth. If the traffic was up, so was I. If it was down, so was I. I hit the refresh button on Firefox like a gambler pulling the lever of a slot machine. Eventually, when my obsession reached a peak, I decided to go back to my counselor and talk about it. That was a weird conversation and went something like this. Chuck the counselor. You've created an army of idols, John. Me. What do you mean, an army of idols? Chuck the counselor. The readers of your site have become an army of idols for you. You're worshiping them and dependent on them to dictate how you feel. And they're always attacking. Me. Wishing I was saying something more intelligent in case this conversation made it into a book later. How so? Chuck the counselor. If your readers give you affirmation, if they leave nice comments or affirm you with good traffic, you misappropriate that and use it to feel better about yourself. So that's essentially an attack because you're using it to cripple your innate self-worth. If your readers leave you a hateful comment, that's a direct attack. In both ways, you've set up a situation where you get attacked regardless of what happens. Chuck the counselor is smart because that's exactly what I did. If the traffic numbers weren't good when I posted in the morning, I would quickly write a new post for the afternoon, panicking that I was going to lose people. Instead of using the traffic as a tool, I let it become my master and responded accordingly depending on what the numbers said. I thought that I was perhaps the only one who did this until I heard business guru and best-selling author Seth Godin address this in a conference. Someone asked him how many subscribers he had to his blog. He told them he didn't know. Because if he knew, he'd be tempted to make that number grow, and he'd start to create content just to make the number grow. Then he said something that I think is so applicable to closing the gap between a day job and a dream job. You can't use analytics to figure out the message. In other words, you can't allow your results or the measurement of your progress to control your dream. What you do, the message, so to speak, has to be true and honest and come from the core of what you care about, not be a whim in the whirling winds of analytics. You might be better at this than I am. I'm not great at using analytics without getting all tangled in them. When I see that a post about Justin Bieber got the most traffic one month, I am tempted to write another post about Justin Bieber. But that's not what I started out to do. I never felt called the high traffic numbers. I felt called to share my ideas. Those are two different things. So for the most part, I now leave analytics alone. Thanks, Chuck. When I do use them, I try to look at the progress of a month instead of a day or a week. Because when you get obsessed with measuring the progress of your dream, no matter what it is, you overestimate the importance of a day. When I see traffic dip sharply on a Tuesday, it's easy to think the site is about to go under. But if I'm really committed to living out a 50-year dream, if the canvas on which I am painting is five decades big, then a single Tuesday doesn't hold a lot of weight. So if your dream is to open a restaurant, become a missionary, go back to school, or anything else, what should you measure? Measure hustle first. I think measuring the effort you're putting in is a much more honest gauge of your progress. 
It's also the only part of this process you can really control. There are a million factors that play into getting traffic on a website or closing a sale or any other sign of a hit for your dream. There's only one who impacts the amount of hustle. You. Measure the things you can control before the things you can't. You can measure the number of days you got up early to work on your dream. You can measure the number of emails you responded to on your website. You can measure the number of dream jobs you applied for. That is what's going to matter at first. And if you set a high hustle goal and miss it, you are rarely disappointed. You still made progress. If you miss a hit goal, you're far more affected. My team leader set a huge, audacious sales goal for this book. If I miss it, if the book doesn't sell as many as we hoped, then we'll definitely have a conversation about that. He'll hold me accountable to that goal. But the first thing he'll really hold me accountable to is the hustle I put into making that goal happen. We'll measure my hustle. Did I speak as often as I could have? Did I hold as many smart promotions on my blog as I could have? Did I write the best possible book I could have? When the PR team at work needed things from me, was I quick to respond? When the sales team needed information, did I give it to them right away? When a speech didn't work well, did I rewrite it so that it was better the next time? These are the types of questions my boss will ask me, but they're also the questions I'll ask myself long before he calls a meeting. If I miss a goal, which sometimes happens when you set huge ones. I want the reassurance that I did everything in my power to make it happen. I want the peace in knowing that it wasn't for lack of hustling that I missed the target for my dream. I want to know that the one thing in my control was under control. I don't mean to say you should never measure your hits. You should. I did. We used Nielsen BookScan to gauge book sales and observed blog traffic to pick out the best cities for my book tour. I believe there's tremendous value in measuring hits, but the point is a matter of priority. Measure hits before hustle, and you're likely to end up failing in more ways than one. Measure hustle before hits, and the hits will come in due time. The next step is making sure you know what to do with that success. Chapter 7. Learn to be successful at success. Robert Downey Jr. ruined my impression of what happens to you when you publish a book. Well, he and Jody Foster both had a part in crushing my childhood dreams. But if you see them, if you ever sit next to them on a flight, please don't bring the whole thing up. They'll pretend they don't know what you're talking about, but in your heart, you'll know they know, and you'll probably be detained by TSA for starting an in-air celebrity feud. There's a slim chance they don't remember what happened because they both make so many movies. I, on the other hand, have not forgotten. Years ago, Jodie Foster directed a film called Home for the Holidays, starring Downey Jr. It was an interesting movie based on a short story by a talented author named Chris Redant. So what, right? Wrong. There's a big so what with Chris Redant. I met her when I was writing branding and product descriptions at Bose. Prior to meeting her, I believe that if you wrote and published a book, from that moment on, you slept on piles of money. Though I made fun of that perception earlier in the book, it was the perception I once had too. I thought success as an author meant an instant rapper level existence. Gold teeth, rims of diamonds, lighting money on fire just to watch it burn all pretty. Chris Redant popped that wildly inaccurate expectation of my dream for me. She wrote the book Home for the Holidays. Not only did she write it, but the book got turned into a movie. Not just an art film where a symbolic glass of milk is broken in slow motion over cobblestones with someone speaking soft French in the background. Her book was turned into a big Hollywood movie directed by Jodie Foster. In addition to the dump truck of cash you get for writing a book, she should have gotten a second dump truck of cash for the movie. She didn't. She was doing the exact same job I was at Bose. We were both in the same size cubicles with the same responsibilities and the same corporate expectations. Was something wrong with Chris? Did she do a horrible job managing all her author cabbage? Nope. She was an incredibly talented author who worked hard on her craft. There was nothing wrong with Chris. Something was wrong with me. I had grossly failed to define what success looks like for a writer. I had greatly misinterpreted what success looks like for a dream. And it cost me years of frustration. Years that I'd prefer you not go through. It's time 
to define. If I were an NFL player, one of my goals each year would be to stay out of news stories that involved me and the phrase outside a nightclub. Forget the injuries you receive out on the field, battling against 300 pound giants. The most dangerous place on the planet for a professional athlete is outside a nightclub. For those of us without a lucrative contract with an NFL team, the space outside a nightclub isn't that deadly. But if you're going to chase your dream, there's another space you need to be careful of success. It sounds ironic, but more dreamers fail in success than they do in failure. Success is like the Bermuda Triangle of dreams. There are two primary reasons. The first is that we tend to only view success as a good thing. We plan a million ways not to fail. We erect processes against failure and establish backup plans if things go wrong. We don't spend nearly as much time, if any at all, safeguarding ourselves from success. We strive for success. We reach for it. We yearn for it. We aim for it with everything we've got. And when we get a taste of it, we're often woefully unprepared for the challenges that come. The attention, the opportunities, the desire for people to tell you what you want to hear instead of what is true. All these multiply with success. You need to be prepared. The other reason success is so dangerous is that we get arrogant. No one gets cocky when they fail. No one ever says, that guy failed so badly that he got really full of himself and ended up alienating everyone in his life. Arrogance only runs with success, and it's dangerous. Author Malcolm Gladwell summarized this problem in a speech he gave. Incompetence irritates me, but overconfidence scares me. Incompetent people rarely have the opportunities to make mistakes that greatly affect things, but overconfident leaders and experts have the dangerous ability to create disaster. He was specifically referring to the business leaders who contributed to the housing market and credit collapse of 2008 to 2009. But he spoke a truth that applies to even the smallest dream. When you're dreaming alone in a cubicle at work, you have very little ability to really impact things. But when you start working on your dream, overcoming risks and hustling, you'll start to gather some momentum. You might not run a company of 10,000 people. But as a mom or dad, your dream decisions will greatly impact the lives of your children. As a single adult, your actions can have a surprising impact on the friends and family members who are cheering you on. If your dream involves giving back to your community or another country, whole parts of the world can be affected by what you do. And with the internet and social media, your ability to, as Gladwell explains, create disaster is only amplified. It only takes a handful of followers on Twitter or Facebook to get cocky. It only takes a few blog comments or purchases of your widget to feel like you're Leonardo DiCaprio on the bow of the Titanic, which might be a more accurate metaphor than you realize. As Jimmy Fallon, host of The Late Show, described his movie failures after his successful run on Saturday Night Live, you start thinking you're awesome when the truth is you're not. But isn't success what we're aiming for? I didn't start my blog with the hope that it would fall flat. I didn't write my books with the expectation that I could sell them slightly better than the average author. Not at all. I want you to be successful with your dream. I want all of us to be successful. I just don't want your success to kill your dream, which is why there's one critical thing you have to do before you get successful. Define your enough. When the stuff Christians like blog took off, I got nervous. All of a sudden, people were telling me I was special and interesting and smart and a whole lot of other things I'd never had groups of strangers tell me. I wasn't ready for it. I started to feel the tendrils of arrogance wrapping around my ankles. I started writing the blog with an almost maniacal level of focus. It became my obsession and started to cost me relationships. As a stopgap for that, I decided to interview leaders who seemed to have it all together. Some would meet with me for coffee. Some blew me off. Because despite thinking I was important, I had only a mildly successful niche blog. On the success ladder, I was very, very, very low. One of the leaders who agreed to meet with me was Lanny Donahoe, a comedian, author, camp founder, hybrid of an entertainer. We sat in his office one afternoon, an octagon shaped room in an old Victorian house in Alpharetta, Georgia. On most of the eight walls, he had big boards with ideas blocked out on colorful post it notes. It felt like being inside Saturday Night Live. 
I told him I was worried about what was happening with the modicum of success I was experiencing, and he told me a story. Here, in a complete paraphrase, because I had no idea how important this conversation would become, and certainly did not scribble it down lightning fast like a squirrel at the time, is what he said. John, people and stories you remember always say your name, but never usually do in real life. Have you ever used futureme.org? It's a site where you can send yourself emails in the future. You can write an email today and post it so that it comes to you in a week, a month, a year, whenever. I did that a year ago. I was working on a project that was killing me. The money was great. The opportunity was huge, but it was literally killing me. I was ill and stressed out and so unhappy. In that moment, a year ago, I fortunately had the clarity to send myself a message in the future. A few weeks ago, I found myself on the doorstep of another big opportunity. The money was great. The project was huge, and I was about to take it. When a message from Lanny Donahoe to Lanny Donahoe showed up. Know what it said? Don't take projects like this ever again. You're in pain right now, getting crushed by this project. If you ever have a chance to take this type of project again, be careful. Say no, please. I had forgotten all about that situation. I had moved on and was about to jump back into that same type of situation. But I didn't because the me from a year ago sent a message to the me of today. At the time, I thought Lanny was being a little silly. I once saw him bring a live camel into a conference, so silly is definitely in his wheelhouse. But since I felt like I was drowning at the time, I tried it. I was wrong about Lanny's advice. It was an amazing experience. There is something really powerful about writing yourself a letter in the future. It forces you in an unexpectedly creative way to wrestle with what you really want out of life. It makes you strip away a lot of your layers and get down to some of your core truths. On April 12, 2009, having just finished writing the Stuff Christians Like book, I sent myself an email a year before it would release. At the time, I worked at autotrader.com. I wouldn't move to Nashville and take the Dave Ramsey job for another 16 months. Here's an excerpt of the email I received from myself on March 3, 2010. Dear John, the book Stuff Christians Like has probably released at this point. It's March, and you might be tempted to run around like crazy saying yes to every opportunity to speak and be interviewed and write. Or maybe there aren't any. Who knows? But in the midst of this time, I want you to remember that a few weeks ago, in March 2009, you sat outside with Jenny on the side of your house in the brown Adirondack chairs with the sun setting, and you thought to yourself, this is enough. I have a beautiful wife, a house to live in, two wonderful children, a job. This is enough. There's no reason to chase money or material possessions when the book comes out. I have enough. Remember that in case you are tempted right now to think you've got to compromise your life in some sort of way to sell more copies of the book. It's just a book. It's not going to deliver you some sort of wonderful life. God has already done that. Stay brave, stay contrarian, stay John Acuff. In the middle of March 2010, that email showed up in my inbox. I had long forgotten it. I was in the center of a very noisy time. People were telling me to quit my job that second. Opportunities were multiplying like small, fluffy rabbits. I was deep, deep into chase mode. And there was one word in that email that almost a year later I can't stop thinking about. It's not my misspelled version of Adirondack. No double O and a lowercase a. The word that stood out to me was enough. The whole email was pretty convicting, but that word wouldn't let me go. Enough. As in, it's enough. As in, you have enough. Don't let the dream you're chasing blind you to the life you already have. As in, success will tell you that you're enough is not enough. And it will keep you on a treadmill of your own design, but a treadmill nonetheless. That, to me, is the key to being successful at success. Instead of chasing enough, you have to define it. If you chase it, you'll never catch it. Enough is incredibly quick. Much like perfection, it seems to remain just out of reach. As soon as we sell $1 million worth of products, we'll have enough business. As soon as I hit 20,000 comments on my blog, I'll have enough to feel good about my platform. As soon as I make partner or executive or blank, I'll have enough freedom to take some time off. 
but we often never reach enough when we chase it. On the other hand, you are guaranteed to get to enough when you define it. You only find enough when you tell enough where to be found. Former Lakers coach Pat Riley touched on the problem of enough in his book, Showtime. He called it the disease of more and asserted, success is often the first step toward disaster. NBA Hall of Famer Isaiah Thomas elaborated on that problem in his own basketball experience. In Cameron Stooth's book, The Franchise, he says, a team wins a championship one year and the next year, every player wants more minutes, more money, more shots and it kills them. But it's hard not to be selfish. The art of winning is complicated by statistics, which for us becomes money. The disease of more transcends teams and is true of all of us as individuals. The first taste of success, of winning, awakens the giant of enough. And if it's not already defined, it will grow out of control. Before you get hit with that first wave of success, sit down with a piece of paper or a futureme.org email and define what your enough will look like. I am still learning this lesson. This week, I wrote myself an email that I will receive a year from now. I wrote about this book. I wrote about my faith and my family. I continue to define my enough. I hope this book is extremely successful. I hope you give it to everyone you know. I hope that it sells 100,000 copies and changes lives all over the world. But I'm not going to wait for that success to tell me the whole experience is enough. I've already defined that. Just to jump off the script for a second, I actually got a future me org email yesterday from me that I had sent during January when I was writing this book. And it was just encouraging me about how I was living and what I needed to be doing. And it was it was a moment of clarity from the past sent to the me of the future. And so this is something I love doing and will continue to do. It wasn't just something I did once with the Stuff Christians Like book. This is one of those processes for me that really helps. Don't burn out. When we talk about chasing our dreams and successfully doing more of what we love with our lives, we often throw caution to the wind. We work until we drop and shrug off rest as something people who don't have our dream do. We burn the candle at both ends. I was curious about that phrase and looked it up. My expectation was that it was pinned by a poet who lived a fast, dangerous life, smoking hand-rolled cigarettes and writing on scrolls. I was right in believing it was from a poem. I was wrong about the poet. Edna St. Vincent Millay said it. Here's what she wrote. I burn my candle at both ends. It will not last the night. But ah, my foes and oh, my friends, it gives a lovely light. When I read that, I assumed that was one of Edna's only poems, the speed and intensity of her light burning out quickly. I couldn't have been more mistaken. She actually wrote for decades. She was no one-hit wonder but instead won the Frost Award for her lifetime contribution to American poetry. She's a legend in the poetry world. But I fear we've twisted her words. We've treated that line about burning a candle at both ends as if it's prescriptive, not descriptive. As if the best sign of real success is burning out. Burnout is a badge of honor. Exhaustion is the mark of excellence. No one sets out to kill their dream through exhaustion, but it often happens because dreams are ravenous. They will take all the time you give them. They will swallow relationships and other priorities and anything in their radius if you allow them to burn both ends of your candle. I didn't realize this had happened to me until we moved away from Atlanta. One night, a week before we moved, my wife and I were sitting outside in our Adirondack chairs. My wife asked me, who of your good friends in Atlanta will you really miss? She asked me that because she had a pretty extensive list. Lori was like her sister. Katie was down the street and vital to her. Leanne was developing into one of her best friends. For 30 minutes, she went through a great collection of heart friends she was going to miss when we moved to Nashville. I had a hard time coming up with my list. It's not that I didn't have friends. I did. I ate breakfast with a guy named Matt every other week for four years. I was starting to hang out with my friend Mark from our neighborhood. But to be honest with you, I didn't have many deep heart friends because I didn't invest in relationships once Stuff Christians Like took off. Prior to the success of the blog, I met regularly with a group of men I loved. I had great friendships that I actively invested in every week. Then the site blew up, and I stopped investing in friendships. Relationships take time, and if you don't feed them, they tend to die. But I was so in love with my dream of writing, and so convinced that I had to burn the candle at both ends, I wasn't willing to feed my friendships. Any free time I had went to developing the blog. 
In the mornings, at night, on the weekends, I was writing, writing, writing. If my wife and kids would go out of town for the weekend, I usually wouldn't connect with anyone. I would sit at home, writing blog entries, answering emails, or growing my Twitter list. I didn't put relationships in the right place on my like versus love list. For two and a half years, I did this, until we moved to Nashville, and I realized I didn't have many people who would miss me. Burn your dream bright. Pursue it with the best of who you are. But don't confuse hustle with burnout. Hustle fills you up. Burnout empties you. Hustle renews your energy. Burnout drains it. Hustle impacts every other aspect of your life in a positive way as you learn to prioritize the things that matter. Burnout impacts every other aspect of your life in a negative way as your dream becomes the only thing that matters. Don't accept burnout as the price or definition of success. It is neither. My sight might have succeeded, but I paid for it with my friendships. The land of later is a myth. I've got to put in the crazy hours at work right now so that eventually we'll be able to have the life we want for our kids. A friend told me that once. He was in the middle of a season where he was working 14-hour days. He'd get up in the dark, come home in the dark, and squeeze his family in there somewhere between coming home at 7 and collapsing into bed at 8. From the outside, it was easy to see that he was killing his family in the name of pursuing his dream job. Though it's easy to judge that person in the pages of a book or when we see it in someone else's life, the reality is that situations like that first take root from a very noble place. As moms and dads, husbands and wives, maybe even as sons and daughters, we all want to provide. We want to give everything we have to make sure our family has anything they need. That's a great desire I would never criticize. But it gets compromised when we make the mistake of believing in later. What my friend was really saying to me was, I have to work like crazy right now so my family can be better off later. The problem is that kids don't believe in later. As parents, we might think that in a few years when they're older, our kids will appreciate and maybe even understand the long hours we put into following our dreams and working, but they don't. Kids believe in right now. That's the only reality they understand. I've never heard a 13-year-old say, my dad wasn't really around for the first 10 years of my life, but I have a really nice bike now, so it all evens out. Kids don't say that. They might not have the ability to verbally communicate what it means to be lonely as a six-year-old, but they are when we ignore them for the sake of pursuing our dreams in order to create a better later. It's not just kids who don't believe in later. Spouses don't believe in it either. I promise you that during the first year of having the blog Stuff Christians Like Blow Up, my marriage didn't get better. I cocooned myself within that dream and pursued it the wrong way, shutting my wife out of the experience. I put her in the last place you want your spouse to be, on the opposite side of your dream. When she would say, I feel like you're spending too much time on your blog, I would hear, I want your dream to fail. I would knee-jerk respond and say things like, this is what I was created to do. This is my purpose. Why do you hate my dream? I am not anticipating the arrival of the husband of the year trophy on my doorstep anytime soon. I made her an opponent of my dream instead of a partner. And it's a surprisingly easy place to arrive when you start obsessing about your dream right now in the hopes of a better later. I once heard comedian Louis C.K. discuss this on the Mark Marin podcast. Louis C.K.'s comedy is brilliant but incredibly vulgar. So when I heard him talk about why dreamers sometimes get divorced, it caught me completely off guard. Here's what he said. I had seen a lot of 60 Minutes episodes where they talk about a guy like Bill Parcells or whoever, and you just look at how he's so manic and so amazing. And then they talk to his wife, and she always has this kind of smile and says, we just know that we don't see Bill from September 1st to February 15th, and that's, you know, you make a deal with yourself, but that's okay, and I love him. And then at the end of the episode, Morley Safer says, and they're divorced now. This isn't an if scenario. It is a when scenario. If you chase your dream the wrong way and get lost in the land of later, you will lose relationships with your kids, with your spouse, and with your friends. Cue mournful trumpet. But there is a way to destroy the land of later myth, and it's actually really simple. You do the math. I learned this idea watching my friend Dwayne deal with the success metrics of being an accountant. 
After he heard his family working a ton of hours, he decided to scale back from being the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. guy and start working from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Although the lines got a little blurred during tax season, he held strong to keeping his true time commitment at home instead of at work. The result was fairly expensive. In his first annual review, his manager told him that they were happy with his performance except for one thing, his time management. While everyone else at the company had spent 50 plus hours of work at the office, Dwayne had averaged 40. The cost of that time difference was going to be reflected in his annual bonus. The bonus had been reduced by $2,000 to reflect Dwayne's decision to work less. Now for Dwayne, someone whose dream is accounting, $2,000 felt like an expensive penalty to pay. Had he just worked harder on his dream, he could have had $2,000 more of success. You'll get into similar situations as you get successful too. Regardless of the specifics of your dream, there will always be just a little bit more success out of reach. And if you don't do the math, you'll think you're missing out. But here's what happened when I asked Wayne to stop and do the math. After taxes, $2,000 only translates to about $1,500. And if he had only worked 10 hours more per week for an entire year, he would have received that money. So the equation is simple. His company offered him $1,500 for 500 hours of his time, or approximately $3 per hour. So Dwayne decided that hanging out with his wife and daughter was worth $3 an hour. He decided that if someone offered to sell him 10 more hours a week with his family for only $30, he would buy it in a heartbeat. So he didn't lose $2,000. He paid $3 an hour to get to know his daughter during a period of her life that is fleeting and fast. Would you make the same decision? I hope so. Now clearly, the math in Dwayne's situation was easy. Yours might be more complicated. The opportunity is more tempting. The siren's call of the land of later even louder. But the principle holds true. If we'll take the time to hit pause and consider the true cost and true gain of a little more success with our dream, we'll often be surprised at the real numbers. Don't turn your platform into a prison. When you get successful at your dream, you're going to acquire something, a platform. This is an important word that is only going to become more important as more people chase their dreams. A platform is the spot you dream from. It's your blog, your audience, your readers, your shoppers. As Godin would say, your tribe. It's already becoming increasingly difficult to get a book published without a platform, for instance. Ten years ago, no one asked you how many Twitter followers you had when you sent them your book proposal. But with so many people swimming in the same pool, it's critical to have a platform that can differentiate you from someone else. And it's not just writers who need platforms. The same principle applies to every type of dream from writing to starting a small business. Fifteen years ago, if you had a website for your business, you were unique. Now, if your company doesn't have an active Twitter account, Facebook strategy, and blog plan, your platform is underdeveloped. The problem with a platform is that if you don't build it the right way, it will become a prison. And one of the best ways to prevent this from happening is to share it. I used to get jealous of people who wrote guest posts on my blog. Although my posts would normally get more comments, there was a part of me that would internally think, oh no, that person is getting popular. This is your blog. You better write something really funny or clever tomorrow, or people will leave your platform in droves. This is a silly, insecure thing to think, but it happens to the best of us, especially when you first get successful. When you start building the platform of your dream, it's easy to get greedy. It never starts out that way, but usually begins with you saying, I need to protect my dream and my brand. You make some good decisions about how you'll live your dream, what your dream will stand for, who will be part of it, etc. And those are smart things to wrestle through. But if you put your arms around your dream too tightly, you'll start to be like a little kid who says, mine, over a pile of toys. And soon, you won't have anyone to play with. Squeeze too tightly and you choke your dream. If you're afraid to share the platform with someone else, you'll eventually be afraid to leave it at all. And that's really the definition of a prison, a place you can't leave. Not only will you become a convict of your dream, 